Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 771 for June 24th, 2023, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Bart Bouchotts back with another installment of Programming by Stealth number 152. How are you doing today, Bart? I'm doing mostly okay. I'm, I'm mildly cranky at the universe because a piece of glass made my day unpleasant. Oh, on the bike wheel, bike tire? Yeah, and it turns out that I have three spare tires for the mountain bike and zero spare tires for the road bike. I thought I had two and one. Oh. I did not have what I thought. So did you carry Amazon, your bike home? I was very close to home, so it, oh. I I sort of limped home on it, but th- it's ruined. Like I, I thought, oh, I'll just fix this puncture. Oh no! Oh, oh no. no! So Amazon now, Prime Steve- is going to get one to me as quick as possible. Oh, I bet. Steve said something funny when he heard you had a a piece of glass. He goes, oh, man, don't you wish you did? You know why? Because I have a slow leak that they can't find. I'm losing one PSI (laughs) per day. So help it along. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. If it just had a big gouge in it, but they they can't figure out what's wrong with it. But it just, we were gone for five days and it lost five PSI. So I, I can't keep pumping it up every day. No, so anyway. the, yeah, they're hard to pump up Tesla tires. Some of our garages uh, aren't strong no. enough, I've discovered. We've got just a, we got a little home unit. It's real easy. It's just plug it in. It's just a regular tire. Yeah, it There's takes nothing. as much as a, as, a, as a heavier vehicle tire does. Maybe all of your, maybe all of your pumps are stronger than ours, but here I have to be careful. Wait, this, I, I'm holding my hand up. It's like the size of a loaf of bread, my pump that I use at my house. I plug it in yeah. the wall. It's got, and it does it. Yeah. It's not real but quick. The, the Tesla needs 45 PSI, and a lot of our stuff only goes to 30. Really? Yeah. I'm we have smaller used to cars going to that. Oh, yeah, I guess. Your little bitty adorable cars. Yeah, yeah the we all dinky did European cars. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, anyway, we should probably get started because we have what I think is going to be a challenging lesson. I have pre-read the, read the notes, and I have lots of questions, so we better dig in. Yeah, and we it's been a month, so that isn't helping things. Um, so <laughs> we, we are in the stage of our story where we're very close to being done, which means we've basically covered an entire language almost. I mean, we are 90% through and we've done a lot more bash than I thought we would because it turns out the community love it. I really yeah. got into it. Everyone's kind of got into it, even though it, it's such a strange language. So... This installment or this challenge gave us a lot of... Uh, a lot of room to reuse pieces we've learned and to assemble them in perhaps slightly different ways. So the same Lego bricks, but we built a different house, if if you'll excuse the analogy. And I don't know how long it's going to take us to describe this and how many questions you have, but you're, you're in your most important role here. You are standing in for the audience. And given where we are in the series, now is the perfect time to stop and ask the questions. Okay, so before you start, I want the audience to know what I told you before we started. A lot of these commands look familiar, but I so I know you've told me them before, but I feel like they're so fuzzy I dreamt them. So I may stop you more on things that's like, you're not allowed to say, Allison, I told you that, because I know you told me these things. I'm sure. Right, of it. Let's take that as a given. The, apart from the point where I say, and this is new, everyone <laughs> understand that these are our old friends or Lego bricks, but there's there's a couple of things going on here. So I've thrown a lot of bricks at you in the last couple of installments, mm-hmm. and I don't know of very many languages that are more dense than Shell. Well, yeah, I'm looking at the commands going, yep, yeah, percent %d. I knew what that was a couple of weeks ago. I've, I've gone back and read and brought up a cheat sheet while we're talking, but it's so, it's so concise that there's, there's not a lot of clues to what it is. A lot of document reading, right? When I'm writing shell script for real in the real world, I have the docs open a lot Mm. because I have to remind myself what the different operators are a lot because, like I say, it's dense and it's like, you know, percent percent single quote D. What was that again? I'm going to find that out. Single quote. I sat there going, what the? And all of a sudden I went, it's a comma. Yay, I got one. <laughs> it's the anti-gravity <laughs> like comma as I try to make it funny. Yeah, exactly. But you, you, you need to go read it. And that's not a failing, right? The, the skill of being a software developer is to not feel bad about reading the docs and hopefully to get to the point where you can get to the right bit of the docs more quickly. I don't remember, and you're not allowed to tell me you told me, uh, <laughs> unless I asked you directly, did you tell us where the docs are other than just man? I, 
I'm pretty sure I linked to them. Um, I generally stick ago. Bash documentation into Google. It's a horrible site because it looks like it dates back to the age of Bash. It it's barely formatted white black, black text on a white background with no sidebars or nothing. It is the most primitive looking thing you've ever seen. You're like, is this the official documentation? Oh, <laughs> so it is. <laughs> okay, well, as um, long as it's the language that's dense, not me, uh, we'll, we'll we'll run with it. Right, and I, like I say, it is normal to need to go read the docs. That is that is not a bug. That is that is how this language works. Okay. So our challenge. A month ago, right, that also doesn't help. Our challenge a month mm-hmm. ago was to write a script that would print out a pretty version of the multiplication table. So we had done multiplication tables when we learned about looping. And the point of the exercise then was to learn about loops because they were new to us. Whereas right. now the point of the exercise was to practice string formatting using printf. And so this is about pretty, right? We've done just print the numbers. This mm. is about pretty, and I kind of went to town on pretty in my sample solution, and I use it as an opportunity to try to bring in lots of pieces from the past. So I, I sort of intentionally went, this is a bells, whistles, and maybe even a cherry solution. <laughs> okay. So what you needed to do was to write a script that would take one required argument, which was a number. So if it was three, then you wanted the three times tables. If it was a four, you wanted the four times tables. By default, it should go from 1 to 10, like you would have done in school. But you could optionally give it a minus S for start or a minus E for end, although I believe I very foolishly gave them terrible names in the actual challenge, minus lowercase m and minus uppercase m, and I literally start the show notes by saying I was an idiot. So my sample solution uses start and end. I actually uh, didn't care which they which they gave me whether they were min or max in my solution. But it, lowercase m was min and uppercase m was max. You wanted start and end, and that's fine. But it does mean that the solution won't look anything. It, it is does have different things in it than ours. But I think we can. I think we can run with that. Yeah, and like I say, it was after I started writing the code I realized that I don't actually care whether we count up or count down, and therefore min and max are silly, whereas start and end are actually what we're doing. And your I solution... did a test to see whether they gave me the first whether the the uh, minimum was less than the maximum, and if it wasn't, I just did it in the other order. Oh, that's another way to do it. Is yeah, flip them. Yeah, but isn't yeah. that how USB C works? It basically checks the wires and sees am I plugged in the other way around? I'll flip myself instead of the old USB A <laughs> way of making you flip it. Right? There you go. Um, uh, the other thing I yes, um, and so it could be one to ten by default or to the values you specified. Now this code took me a long time to write, so that's a, that's another important thing to say. The sample solution here was not something I threw together in five minutes. And while I was writing it, I was I pulled my hair out a few times, and I don't have much of it left. Um, and so one of the things I would do in the real world is give my code a debug mode where it would tell me what it was doing under the hood. And so I decided to show instead of tell. So my sample solution accepts an optional flag minus D, which makes it chatty. It tells you mm. what it's doing. Uh, but so as not to pollute my output, I made it chatty to standard error. That way you can pipe it to different places, depending on what you want. Okay. And if you don't put the minus D, you don't end up having to see all that garbage. Precisely. So basically, if you know about the minus D, you can see what it's doing, which is really useful when you're building up format strings and things. Because like I said, the syntax is a bit, you know, dense. So you'll find the full solution in pbs151-challengesolution.sh in the installment zip, and it's a long one. Now I have, I pasted it all into the show notes, because I figured that way people don't have to download the zip file to see everything. But ultimately, big picture wise, we start by making sure you've given the correct arguments using the... um, get opts that we've now encountered a few times. And so we basically, we do our little dance to make sure that um, they've given numbers and then we save the values for use later. Um, I'm saving the number, the thing we want to do the table for as n, because I just couldn't think of a better name for a number. Um, the n times tables. I, don't know, I, I was very low in imagination. Um, Can I ask you a dumb question? Where no, in no your thing. code... Do you do you assign the the value that they're going to multiply 
to n. I, I literally couldn't find it. Okay, so you see we have a while get up to do and then a whole bunch of stuff, and then we have a done. And, and none of them are n. Correct, because the n is not minus n, it's just the first normal argument. So okay. after we're done with the optional ones, we do that shift oh, okay. copy paste thingy to make them poof yeah. away. Therefore, okay. what's left is dollar one. So okay. then we say n becomes equal to dollar one. Okay, gotcha. I see it now. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, at that point, I was already getting things wrong. So at that point, I put in my first debug statement. So. What I chose to do was make a variable named do debug so that my code would read nicer. So if minus n do debug, then my various debug statements. So okay. I'm going to do one of my first, I'm sure you've told me this, but so it says if, and then it's got the double brackets, this is going to be the test. It says minus n space dollar do debug. So dollar yes. do debug is going to be a function? It's a, it, it's, dollar a, de, well, it's a variable. No, so it's a variable. It has a value of one if they gave it to us. Correct. Okay, but what has minus n got to do with that? The n okay, is, so the, is the, the number they're giving us. No, minus n. Okay, so dollar n is our variable. We're now inside square bracket universe, right? We're in the test. So square bracket, square bracket means we're doing a test. And all of the... Right, square bracket, square bracket means test. So minus eq for equals... Minus GT for what greater than. What did minus mean? What did right, I'm getting there. Mean? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So minus Z is for empty string. And the opposite of minus Z is minus N for not empty string. So it was one of the ones that I made that I basically <sighs> said, you're going to hate this one because it's not obvious. So minus N is not empty string. So if... So of all the variables you could have chosen for the input number to be n, and then use n there. And I, I, I mentioned this to Bart before, you use n two more times below where it doesn't mean the same thing. So there's four different, the letter n means four different things in this code. Maybe back to the fact that the language is dense, but I don't 100%. think I would pick n. I would not pick n, because n has four meanings here. I, okay, in my mind, $n is a thing. Like it, the variable n is $n. And in other places, it's whatever it is. So minus n is a, is a test, right? Minus, minus anything is a test, I guess, is, is, is sort of the mnemonic. When you okay, enter so you square... tell me when the n is the number, and then I'll learn all the other things it means as we go. Because I know you use it three, uh, two more times. Okay. I, I, I'm curious where else okay. I use it. Um, I'm not... Well, we'll keep I going. don't remember where, but there are 150 okay. lines of code here, so... So, yeah. this, so this says if... if uh, if do debug is not empty, in other words, yeah. if it's one, then yeah. we're going to do this set of code. Yes. Okay. Which is just print out. Now, I prefix my debug statements with debug in all caps and a colon so that when I'm looking at the output, I can mm -hmm. easily tell when I'm just telling myself things versus when I'm, you know, when it's part of the program. Um, well, you, you might like this. In uh, Visual Studio Code, there's a plugin called To Do Tree. And you can have it format different kinds of things you write in different ways. So I have one that says debug and it highlights it in like bright yellow. So when I'm done with my code and I've got everything working, I can find them all. Yeah, oh, that is, that is actually really nice. Yeah. In this case, um, you want them in there, but okay. So now yeah. the do debug is. So we say we're printing out strings inside double quotation marks, which makes them interpolated strings. Mm -hmm. So. In that case, we're printing out the letters D E B U G colon space N space 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 equal sign dollar N. Okay. That is the letter N. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, but I'm showing the value of my variable. So I give the name of the variable equals the value of the variable. I mean, the point of the print statement is to show the value of n. If I named it anything but n, it would, it would make the world's worst debug statement. If I'm telling myself n has this value, I need to say n equals dollar n. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> I, I, um, I'm just thinking, when, when, t when teaching somebody who doesn't know what all these things mean, n was, was a choice that makes things harder. But I, I see what it means. Because then you say echo debug start equals dollar start and equals dollar end. And then yeah, you, um, 
do the greater than ampersand two, which I think is send it to standard error. No, standard Correct. out. Which one? Error? Uh, okay, so before the greater than sign is is the default output, so that's standard out. And then we are saying make standard out go to number two, which is standard error. So we're redirecting. Okay. So echo would normally go to standard out, and we're saying, no, no, okay. no, don't go to standard out, go to standard error instead. Got it. Okay. I'm with you. Okay. So... We make sure everyone has given us everything we want, right? We're quite a few lines of code in, and so far all we have done is ask for all of the different arguments from every, or all of the different variables from everyone, saved them for ourselves into three variables, $n, $start, and $end. And if they've given us garbage, we have been cranky at them. Um, it is generally speaking good practice, if your script can be cranky for multiple reasons, to use different exit codes for each reason. Because you have 255 of them at your disposal. So that gives you 255 different ways to be cranky. So it actually can be useful. The one thing is you should write a comment at the top of your script that actually says what your exit codes mean. So you'll find at the very, very top, I have listed my two exit codes. Exit code one is for missing a required argument or using an unsupported flag or optional argument. Error code two means you gave me the right arguments, but they have silly values. So I needed one argument, you gave me one, but you gave me pancakes, and really I wanted a number. And yes, you gave me a minus E, but you gave me wobbly, and what I actually wanted was a number, right? So that's the difference in one and two. And so you'll see in my various bits of code, I say exit one or exit two, depending on why I'm cranky at the user. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, let me ask is, a, a procedural question. Should I, I'm scrolling up and down and up and down right now. Am I supposed to be down where you're explaining it in text or am I supposed to be looking at the raw code? I've decided I'm just going to walk through the, I'm walking through the raw code because I say the same things. Okay. So I, um, because I think we should talk about the bigger structure. So at this stage of the code, we have, we, have just, we have basically gotten our input. We now have three variables. All of that was to make sure we absolutely, positively, definitely have three numbers. So okay. then it's about starting to make our pretty strings. And I'm trying to print my table out so that it's always the same width. And I have framed it with the ASCII characters for a table. Because if people can remember to the days when there was no GUI, you would have these really pretty menus with perfect little frames around them and stuff. <laughs> and that was all done with ASCII characters that are not, yeah, like, they're not the pipe symbol. They're a little bit taller. They touch the very, very top of the character. You can still get to them if you go into the BIOS on Windows, I think. You see, oh, actually, you can yes. see what, exactly what you're talking yes, about. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, and okay. the Mac OS X character viewer will show them to you. Um, and so I basically went in and I found the ones for top corner, uh, the four corners, horizontal mm -hmm. and vertical, and stuck them in my, basically stuck them in my clipboard. Um, and then I used them in my format string. So my table gets printed out with this very pretty ASCII table around it. Um, okay. But if you're going to print a pretty table, it's really important that every row is always printed out the right length, because otherwise your table, the illusion breaks immediately if mm -hmm. one of your rows is the wrong length. So again, right. we're talking about making things pretty. So we actually have to calculate the biggest possible width of each piece. So we're printing a table of, you know, our number multiplied by the one in the sequence equals a value. So there's actually three columns there that could be different widths, depending on whether you call the script with the three times tables or the 3,000 times tables. Right. And the fact that we have thousand separators, because we're now pretty printing strings using printf, it means that we can't just say if it's a thousand, it's three wide, it's four wide. If it's a hundred, it's mm -hmm. three wide because the commas and stuff. So I thought about trying to figure out an algorithm and then I went, no. I am going to run each of my numbers through printf and then through word count to minus c for character and just ask it how long they are. And then whichever the longest one gets saved. Yeah. So I have a variable called max m len for the maximum length of the multiplier and max p len for the maximum length of the product. And I have a loop that goes through all of my numbers and it just says if the current one is longer than what I thought was the longest before, update the longest before. And at the end of the loop, my max will be correct. 
So I think I just figured out another confusion I had reading the code. The product is the answer. Seven yes. times three equals 21. 21 is the product. Yes. And the multiplier so what is what changes. So oh, okay. Okay. But you never ask for the, in, well, we'll get to it in the code, but you never ask for the length of the, or store the length of the number that was put in there that I could find. Um, I didn't see well, it, it in the change. calculation. It, it, it doesn't change. So you it must count it somewhere then. I do. There is a little one liner, but it's, yes, actually here. So n len equals the character length for the number, right? So it's the very first one I do. Calculate the maximum length of each column when nicely formatted. n len becomes equal to. Okay. So n len is the length of n. That? I'm going to do something very mean, Alison. So remember I said everything apart from one thing is not new. The one thing, wait, I have too many negatives in that <laughs> sentence, haven't I? One thing is new. One thing, is, yeah, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> There's one thing new. It is a command which is simultaneously trivially simple and yet the most difficult thing to explain that makes most people's heads explode. Okay. And I don't understand how it can be simultaneously simple and confusing, but it absolutely is. And I was in that boat. It took me years to not run away from it. I, I ran away from it for years. It's actually really powerful and really useful. It's the command XRG, and we are going to learn about it in detail. For now, I'm going to say, stick a pin in that line of code, because that line of code is actually illustrative. And what the I line can of tell code you for the for the listeners is the line of code that calculates how long the the length of the variables. Yes. Now n the vast majority of it is the pieces are all, are you know you have a printf percent d with the single quote which we now know is the anti gravity comma. So we're saying we want to print a d a a, a whole number with a thousand separator, and then we mm -hmm. pass it dollar n. So $n will get printed with its comma separator. We pipe that to wc minus c. So wc is the word count command and minus c says, give me the character count. And if we stop listening right there, we're fine. Yes. We should now, know what yes. you just said. <laughs> the, the comment tells you the important piece. The actual length of the number in characters is stored in nlen. Oh, when formatted, so because you've put the, the anti-gravity comma in there. Correct, exactly. So okay. if you wanted to do the 3,000 times tables, it will correctly say that it is five characters five. long. Okay. Which is one more than you might have thought. Mm -hmm. And so then we just assume, we just make a guess, max m len one, max p len one. Right, they're obviously not going to say again, be one. max m len and max p len. Again, so the right. maximum length of the multiplier, so we have our okay. three times tables, it would be three times one, so then one is the multiplier, three times two, then two is the multiplier, three times three, three is the multiplier. Okay. Because that changes, okay. right? In every row in your table, right. that one changes, and so does the answer. Okay. So those two have to be calculated. Therefore, we have okay, to have so two variables. Okay, so max plen is the length of the product, the max length of any product in the table. In the table, yeah, and and we're gonna we're gonna define them as one. Not really assume we're gonna define them as one. Yeah, and then as we're starting to guess. Check was coming. Okay. Yeah, and so then we have a for loop. So a good example of a of a typical shell script for loop for m in, and then we so use that the m dollar. is not minimum. That's not the minimum we were. What would be in our code? It's well, we're we're, we're looping m. over the multiplier. We're looping over the multiplier here, right? So we're going to go from three times one, then three times two, then three times three. So that m is indeed the multiplier. Okay, but that's not the. <laughs> no, it is the multiplier. That's we're not going the over every possible you defined. Okay, this is a new variable we're def we're defining here for m. Right, because we 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 got to okay. go through them from the start to the end. So we're saying okay. sec is the sequence command, dollar start, dollar end. So we are going to, okay. so M is going to go from the start to the end, one by one. Okay. Each time through the loop, it's going. So we're simulating the table, but we're not going to print anything. So we're effectively going through our table in stealth, right? We're going from start to finish okay. in stealth. And each time we're calculating the length. So M len becomes equal to print F with its upside down comma, Pipe it to word count minus C and then hocus pocus and out comes the length stored in mlen. And then we have to decide, is what we got now bigger than our previous biggest? 
Okay. And so one of the things we learned early on that I wanted, I intentionally did this to reinforce old knowledge, is you can use the ampersand ampersand, which is the and statement, to work as a really quick if. Because remember I said Bash does lazy evaluation? Sure. <laughs> okay, so with, with lazy no, no, evaluation... No, no, sure I remember is what I mean. I believe you. Okay, well... <laughs> Do you want me to explain lazy evaluation or not? Uh, I guess uh, is what I'm I asking. want you to explain this line, and if you need to explain lazy evaluation, then yes. Okay. So the uh, ampers for something to be for the final result of an and to be true, both sides have to be true. Okay. As right as it always is. Yeah. So if the first side of the and is false, then lazy evaluation says don't execute the second side. Okay. Which is why it works like an if. Because if the condition mln is, le is g minus gt greater than max mln, so if the length we've just calculated is greater than the maximum length, only when that's true does the second statement happen. Okay. I had forgotten that. And then it's, the second um, statement is now take our max, uh, uh, our maximum length of the mm, multiplier of the multi of the multiplier we're just doing the multiplier right now the maximum length of the multiplier update it with what you just finished calculating mln precisely the current value for the length of the multiplier okay correct so and then we do the same trick again but we have a little bit more work to do because to get the length of the product, we have to actually calculate the product, right? I can't get you the length of 3 times 10 unless I do 3 times 10 first. Okay. So the first thing I do is I print $n star $m, which is whatever our n is multiplied by m, and I pipe that into our basic calculator, the BC command mm -hmm. for doing actual math. Mm -hmm. Then I run it through printf with a little bit more hocus pocus that we are absolutely going to learn about in the future, and then I count its length. Okay. So multiply it, count, make it pretty, then count its length. And it, until and it's it pretty, it's wrong. Into, so you're you're calculating it. Actually, you're echo, you're calculating it. You're echoing it. You're sending that to the basic calculator, which will run the math, and now it knows what yeah. that value is. Um. And then you then run we printf to, to find out how long, or to print that value out, and then you can pipe that to word count dash c, which counts it. With two yeah. hocus pocuses on this line. Yeah, this is, this line, this line is, this line teaches you everything in the world about XORG. This line is, this line is, this line will be how I teach XORG. Okay. This, this line is the line. This is the line of the entire script. This is it. This is the line. Okay. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about it yet. Okay. We, we will, we will, in, after we put it in its bigger context. Okay. So we do the same trick again, right? We check to see whether what we found is bigger than what we had. And if it is, then we update our biggest. Okay. So now we can do the math to figure out how long is the top of my pretty table, which I'm calling the cap length, because it's the cap on the table. I wasn't sure what else to call it. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what you meant by that. All right. So... It's basically, I, it's eight characters because of the various bases times the maximum length of n, sorry, eight plus the maximum length of the number plus the maximum, sorry, eight plus the length of the number plus the maximum length of the multiplier plus the maximum length of the product. Calculate that and that is the length of the middle piece. I counted the spaces because it's... So when I look at the table that you create, you only have six spaces. Uh, there's an extra space hiding, I think, either side of the table. It is That's right. That's what you say in your code. And I went back and looked at the code and there isn't, I can't account for that extra space. But that's interesting. Well, I know okay. that it's needed because I ran it with my debug statements and it, it, until I did it that okay. way, it was broken. <laughs> we, we'll get there. I'll point to where I'm going. I don't see it, but okay. All right, I, good. I worked it so now we, now we know the length of... The cap, and that's going to, you care about that because that's going to tell you how many, I'm going to call them dashes you're going to need and how many, and two corner pieces. Correct. That's okay. it exactly. Okay. So 
At that stage, we have another debug statement to print out all of these lengths I've just calculated. And that, that took me a long time to get that right because that has all the Xergs and stuff up there. That, that was really hard work to get this far in the code. So now I do myself a little bit of work and I need to print, I need to make my formatting string for each row in the table. So we have a space followed by the character for the side of a table, followed by another space, followed by a placeholder for a number, which we will look at in more detail in a moment, followed by the space, followed by the character X, because that's how we humans write multiply. We're not computers. We don't use a star. Followed by a space, followed by a percent, and then add some stuff, and a D that we'll get to in a moment, followed by a space, the equal sign, a space, another placeholder, a space, the edge of our table, a space, and then our new line character. So that's where we're, where do, you start out by saying that there's, a, that there's a space before that first, I'm going to call it a pipe, but it's not that, sure. that vertical symbol. Yeah. There isn't one in the code. Um, it says f string equals quote pipe. There's no space in between, and I kept looking at it, going, "Where is he saying there's a space?" Uh, sorry, the space is after the pipe. It's before the percent. I'm uh, sorry, I'm stepping through it here with my cursor and the shift key. Okay, okay. Sorry, I think I think is. the notes below say that there's a space before that vertical line, and that's where I've, I I couldn't ah. understand other stuff, so I spent my time counting spaces. <laughs> And yeah, that character actually is really wide because when you select that character, so it goes blue, that's really mm -hmm. wide. So it looks like there's a space there, but there isn't. You're right. The space is after the table edge. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that Bash does that is confusing to people is that if you want to concatenate two strings, you don't use an operator. You just slam them together. And I remember using the word slam them together many, many, many months ago to try and make it funny and therefore <laughs> more memorable. So the first thing we get here is a string from the first double quote to the second double quote is just a string. And then we get the value of n len. So that is going to be a number. So let's pretend it's three. Mm -hmm. Right. So what we're actually getting there is percent or upside down comma. 3D. So if we go back to last week, if you put a number inside your percent D, what you're saying is the minimum length for this number is mm -hmm. three and it's going to be right aligned. So if you can right. imagine... I forget which called, caused it to be right aligned. Doing nothing makes it right aligned. You have oh, to go okay. out of your way to make <laughs> okay, it go good. the other way. Yes. So what I'm looking at as Bart is talking is... Percent, single quote, double quote, dollar, N, capital L, E, N, double quote, D. Yeah. And that does like 700 things right there. <laughs> okay, right. We, so know the, it's a, we know it's a whole number. Uh, yes. Dollar, it's N, of, Leng, is, that's our variable. So that's like three, we're saying, and it's in yeah. quotes because we have to do well, it's that. Not it's not in quotes, right? The, the quote starts, F string becomes equal to quote. Pipe, space, percent, single quote, end quote. That's an end quote. Oh, good. Uh, Wait. Right? Re yeah, so uh, the, the oh, quote starts, uh, okay, after the equal symbol, the quote opens. Okay. That quote ends before the dollar n len. Okay, and then we start so another I'm one. Right, so we're smashing our strings together because that's how Bash... In any other language like JavaScript, we would have a plus in there, but Bash... If we put a plus in there, Bash will go nuts, right? In Bash, you smash them together to stick them together. So they're like magnets. So it's like we have our string from the first, the double quote to the double quote, and then magnetically three, or whatever the value of the variable is, and then we start a new quote, which goes all the way to the next variable which is magnetically connected to it. So this is Bash being very, very dense. Yeah, I believe you, Bart. <laughs> and, and I know we've learned every atomic piece of that, but boy, is that nasty to look at. Right, but that is what I was happens so excited. I thought printf. I knew what it was doing, and I don't. <laughs> I didn't, I should say. Okay. But when you piece it together, what you end up with is percent single quote a number D, which is... Percent D means print me a, d a whole number. The single quote means put in the thousand separators. And the number means make it so long. 
So it does collapse down to sense. But it's a dense language. Yeah. Right? It sure is. And again, this okay. this caused me so much trouble that I had threw a debug statement in there to print out my bloody string. Because it took me a while <laughs> to get that string not to be garbage. Right? So that's why there's a debug statement there. You can tell where Bart got stressed is where Bart put debug statements in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So now what we need to do is make a middle piece for the top and the bottom of our table. So we're going to have our corner pieces and then we have a, a slab that is the door frame, the top and bottom door frame of our table, right? So it's, a, it's not a bunch of dashes? It's a bunch of dashes. That's exactly what it is. Oh, it is. But okay. it's a different length every time. So I need to build it with a loop. So you're calling it a cap insert? Right, because it, but you, it's but used you called twice. it cap mid. Right, because at the top of the table, it's a downward pointing end on each end. And at the bottom of the table, it's the same middle piece. Okay. But it's, it's, it's start and finish characters that are the opposite of each other. So I used Okay, you called it twice. cap insert, but then you had cap mid, and I thought that was something different. So cap mid means cap insert. Uh, yes, because this is the first time I actually build a variable. Yeah, you're right. I, I should have. Okay. And you did yeah, 48 I call it cap things mid. on one line here with semicolons. Yes. So this is, again, me finding an excuse to, 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 to show things. So normally when I do loops and stuff and if statements, I do something that Google results uh, when you go to Stack Overflow doesn't do. I space it out for something, new line, do, new line, some stuff, new line, done. If you go to Stack Overflow, you will generally see that collapsed with 4M whatever semicolon do at the very least. And so if I don't tell you about this, the more you Google stuff, the more you're going to think I've let you down because the Google results are going to be full of semicolons. And all a semicolon means is pretend it's a new line. That's it. It just tells okay. Bash, treat this like it's on a new line. So, and so if that I want is to read your code. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I can take this and just take out the semicolons and make them new lines. Correct. And then you're left with a for loop that just plus equals the dash into cap mid. Okay. So you're going to do that, but for how how long are you going to do that? From one to the length of the cap. Sec one dollar cap length. Okay, I thought the cap length was just the middle piece, but you're saying it's the it's, it, it's two the more length of the than piece. the length. No, no. Okay. I mean, we're building the middle piece, right? So it is it is the length of the middle piece. So I just need to I need a string. If if so the middle piece is ten wide, include, I need ten. Cap length mm -hmm. <laughs> is the length of the entire thing, not just the middle piece. No, no, no. It's just a middle piece. So this is just a loop to make my middle piece, right? It's, I need 10 okay. dashes. Okay. And then I'll put a little corner on them. It's, it is literally just a loop to go from one to how many dashes I need. Okay. I, I, I follow you. Again, the okay. variable names are killing me, but uh, I'm trying to keep up. Okay. Okay. So now the next step of the code says print the table. So I'm going to stick my table into a variable, which I have named table. Do I get points on that one? Is that one? Is that one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I don't know what table is yet. We'll see whether I like it. Well, it's an it empty string, there. right? Table becomes equal I, to I an know. empty string. We'll find well, no, out. No, the, the variable being, to build the table into in it. is okay. the table. So the okay. first thing we print is the top, right? So render top cap row. So okay. we have our brackety symbol. So we're using printf. So what we now this is this is very new to us, right? We're this is reinforcing last time's knowledge. This is not something you've known for ages. So printf okay. by default writes the standard out, but it if you use minus v, it writes to a variable, uh, and the variable will be the um, printf minus v. Yeah, the variable comes next. So the variable here is called row. So we're saying printf okay. minus v row. So render this string pretty into the variable row. Then we so give we our, defined, our pattern. We never defined row before now. This is effectively we're defining defined. it now. Yes. Okay. I, I think I remember that. Okay. Yeah. 
All right. So we have our string that is the pattern for printf, which is open, which is a funny character for the corner of a table. Percent mm -hmm. s is a placeholder for a string. Then we have the other side of the funny character for the other side of the table, a new line character. And then we pass in one argument, which is cap mid, which is that number of dashes we've just made a loop. And that gets substituted and in between. that's going to get squirted in for the string in between the yes. two. Yes. Okay, I do Correct. remember that. Okay. So we have now made an appropriately length top of the table. And then we okay. say table plus equals dollar row. So our table has now, has one row in it. It's the top of the table. Okay. So then we do our loop for M in our sequence from start to end. So okay. each we M is our We finally get to calculate the product? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> calculate the product. P becomes equal to, and then we use the uh, basic calculator again to calculate dollar $n star dollar $m. Mm -hmm. And then we need to print it into our pretty string. So again, printf minus v row. So again, we're saving it to dollar row. Our string is the horrible string that we built in that horrible line of code we both hated with all of those percents and quotes and stuff. That's our pattern. Mm -hmm. So we're just using it now. Mm -hmm. And we pass, it has three placeholders, so we give it three values, n, m, and p, the number, the multiplier, and the product, and they get dropped into the 3% d's. So we already used the variable row, and we, we defined it with the printf minus v command, and then we mm -hmm. uh, plus equaled it into the table, and now you're mm -hmm. defining it again. Is yes. it writing over it, or yes. did it cease to exist? Is that a philosophical question? It's, it's still... <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, we're always worried about scope. So does it it's, not it's exist stomping at that on point? It. So you could, it's no, it, it's the same it. variable. It's stomping on it. Yeah, so it, effectively, I'm using it as a, as a carrier okay. to get from the printf into my table. Okay. I, I do a lot of tabular stuff in, in my uh, time adder thing, and uh, it, the word row exists at least 700 times in there with different things in front of it, because I keep coming up with new names, but I like stomping on it. That's good. Okay. Yeah, so we're just saying, I want a row sticking in the table. I want a row sticking in the table. I want a row sticking okay. in the table. So we print okay. FR row, we table plus equals dollar row, done. Right, so that mm -hmm. that gets us the body of our table. So okay. now that we've done all the hard work above, the actual printing of the table is trivially simple code. Right, we have yeah. a pattern and we give it three substitutions. Great. Yeah. Then we we invert our logic from the top. We do the same thing again to make a bottom cap, but this time we use the the other corners of the table percent s, and then we send our mid mm -hmm. cap in again, and then okay. one last time table plus equals row. Right. So now we have our full table. So dollar, the variable table now contains everything we want. And then what I said to get bonus credit was that if the output was a terminal, we should put our table through the less command so that it will, if we say, give me the one, give me the thousand times tables from one to a hundred, it should give us a page. Then we hit the space bar. It gives us the next page. We hit the space bar. It gives us the next page like right. happens with commands in git if you do a git log on a repository with a lot of things it will page it for you nicely but mm -hmm. if you pipe that same output to a file it doesn't do that it sends everything to the file and the way it does that is by detecting is standard out a terminal or is standard out anything else okay so that's why we have an if statement here that's the if statement's job. Are we a terminal or are we not a terminal? And so what Jill told us, uh, which I then included in the show notes last time, because Jill is cool. And Jill of right. Kent. Jill of Kent, yes. Sorry, we need to say which Jill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kent is in the UK, by the way, folks. Um, so minus T is the test for whether or not something is a terminal. And it demands to be told what stream it should go and check. And so standard out is the stream one. Mm -hmm. So minus T1 means is standard out a terminal. Then we echo the table and pipe it to less. Else we just echo the table. Now That's pretty simple. It is. Now less has two optional arguments, two optional flags shoved on the end of it because less's default behavior is annoying. If you just pipe something to less that's less than a page long, Less doesn't just print it out and then exit. 
less locks up your entire terminal, prints the thing you want at the bottom of the page, and waits for you to hit Q. That's annoying. Right. So the okay. minus minus quit if one screen takes care of that problem. The other thing less does is when you finish less. So if you, if you like if the man pages use less. If you go mm-hmm. into a man page and you hit Q, what happens to the man page you were looking at? It vaporizes. It vaporizes. Now, do you want your table to vaporize when you got to the bottom? No. no. The minus minus no minus init stops the vaporizing. Oh, interesting. Can you man? You can man less. Minus, that minus, is how no I no describe- dash init? Well, when you man less and you start looking for, basically start reading through how to make it not suck, I basically no, no, read the I whole mean, man page for the, less. I mean, can you do the, can you make the man pages be minus minus no dash in it? I don't know. And do you know how you'd find out? Man, man. Try it. No, man, <laughs> man, because man has okay. a man page. I like it. I like it. So... There's an odd side effect I discovered from what you did there, and I'm wondering whether you didn't notice it. I gave okay. it a big number. I, I told it to go from 3 to minus 17, and then I made my, my, my terminal happen to be very short in height. Mm-hmm. And it drew the table three times, and it wrote colon dot 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 skipping dot 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 in between each one. Why does it do that? Dad, I have I didn't see that. That must be some behavior of less. Yeah, that... and it appears to be related to this quit of one screen, because if I make it tall enough, if I send the exact same command, uh, and it just prints it once. Hmm. I'm not sh- that my terminal didn't do that. Um, so I give it. Got- uh, Give it uh, minus S3, minus E, minus 17, minus D, space 7. So you're saying minus S? 3. 3. Minus E, minus 17. You make it 20. Okay. Yeah. And then I did minus D, 7. Okay. So, oh, you put it in debug mode. Then the... No. Yeah. The, okay. So, I'm not. I'm not going to put it in debug it mode. The... Yeah. Try it at the debug mode, and it should behave properly. Let's, let's see. I got to make it uh, short enough. You got to make the table. You got. Or well, the other enough. way is to go to end on 170, and then I'll definitely. No, it do still it. does it without debug. It's it's if the window is shorter than one table height. So if it if it's scrolling partially off screen, that it causes it. If you if it's tall enough, it doesn't doesn't do it. Well, it skipping. Okay, I've just tried to reproduce that with a tiny little terminal window, and it's not doing it for me. It's behaving perfectly. Well, I can send you a, a scrolling screenshot of it if you would like, but it's it's a hundred percent predictable. Actually, it gets it's you know what it does? It gets down to minus fifteen. That's what it does, and it never so it doesn't get to minus seventeen, which would be the last number, and it and it cuts it off. It doesn't get the bottom cap, and it says skipping, and it did it again minus sixteen. It skipped it again, uh, minus seventeen. Yeah, it does. How, it how are you paging? Four are times. you hitting the space bar? Enter. Uh, well, I can I can show Bart after the fact, but it's a yeah. No, I cannot recreate this because if I hit enter, I get it one line at a time. Until I get hmm. to the end, and then I hit Q to exit out of less. Interesting. Yeah, no, mine is well, behaving perfectly. Uh, mine is still refusing to misbehave. Open? That's exactly I, what I'm what I'm typing. And if I do a, the screen height has to be smaller than the height of the table. I made mine like three car- three letters tall, and it still worked. Hmm. And you've scrolled back, and you don't see this skipping thing. Uh, what did I? Oh, hang on. So I didn't try scrolling. I just did my less and it went through. So you're saying if... No, I, my scroll is working, but I'm using warp. So maybe warp is a nicer term. Oh, you're... This is as much as I can get on screen. Woo! Hello. Uh, this might not be the most interesting thing for everybody else, but I just sent you a screenshot of what I see. That's as tall okay, as so I can... It keeps and, going past that. If you scroll, it's oh, so the scroll. So the weird stuff is if you scroll, 
scroll. It's after the command is finished. When I scroll back up, I can see all this skipping, skipping, skipping stuff. And the okay, table's getting the Mac... printed longer and longer each time. That's the Mac terminal handling its history in a strange way. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Now, it should page the table perfectly for you as you're going, right? I'm using the default terminal. I'm not in warp. I'm in terminal. Right, right. sure, sure, sure. But I mean, yeah. less is doing its thing that as you're looking at it, you're getting it line by line and you can move up and down and it's behaving like less should. Mm. It's like, no, it, so just prints all this, it just prints all this all, all out to the screen. But you're saying your screen was set to three characters oh. high. Ah, I had a, I, I, you did three characters high. I've got a shorter than possible screen and then I increase the height. And that's when I can see, and it finish, It pops out of the less command as I increase the height. So I didn't know I was supposed to be hitting the space bar. Right, so it's, yes, so the paging me, yes, so paging is, is that standard scrolly behavior that you get from less or more. So, yeah, yeah, don't, that, don't hit the space bar. Just well, heighten your, when it's partially drawn, I, I, that's when I lengthened, I was still inside less and I lengthened it and that's what created it. Ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Yeah. I, could, I didn't notice I was inside. I didn't know I was inside less. Yeah. Until you I was trying to understand how yet. the script works. <laughs> okay. Right. No, that, sorry. That explains it. Yeah. Less gets very confused if the universe changes midway. So okay. It's like, but I was making it this size. And then... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad we covered that. Okay. All right. Where do uh, we go from here, Bart? I was going to say, I need to find my show note window again after all the telegram windows and stuff. Okay, so at this stage, the script is at its end. Now, I'm just going to check my own notes to make sure I have said everything to you that I wanted to say. Uh, pretty ASCII tables, check. Calculating the widths, check. Uh, building our format string, check. Sep uh, character, well, command separator, check. Conditional paging of the output, check. Uh... And then, yeah, so this is a decision point, Alison. So either we get into Xargs now or we save ourselves and we make a part two where we get into Xargs. So um, it is 52 minutes long. It's, uh, it's your call. I've got the time, but uh, I have a sort strange of feels suggestion like we should for you. Move on. We should do it next it time. It feels like we should. What do you think? Well, how's about we keep Xargs till next time, because Xargs is going to take a lot of mental energy. And how's about we skip on to what I put in as a second topic, which is arithmetic, because it's easy. Okay, good. That's the only part I didn't read in the show notes, because I was tired <laughs> when I got down to that far. Okay, good. Okay, uh, so sorry, I did, I'm bad at picking up uh, signals. So is that good? Yes, good, good, or good? Yes, that's good. good. Let's, do, let's, let's, uh, let's do some arithmetic. Let's do some arithmetic. So you have probably noticed throughout our code that we have been doing math indirectly. We have been making a string using echo and then making a string and then piping the string to the basic calculator, which is BC. Which is what, you know, BC stands for basic calculator. And then we've been using the dollar open bracket, close bracket, subshell to capture standard out and shove it into a variable. So to calculate the product, we say P becomes equal to dollar open bracket echo open double quote dollar N star dollar M closer double quote pipe BC closer bracket, which is not short or elegant or frankly that easy to read. So debugging <laughs> that code six months from now is unpleasant, especially compared to other languages that we've met along the way. So you're probably saying, but there must be a better way. And there is, but I've intentionally avoided it because I didn't want to flood you with too many brackets at once. Uh oh. <laughs> so just a In reminder. Other words, now you're going to flood us with more brackets. Okay. I'm going to give you some more. But a little recap of where we got to. So the, we learned that single square brackets are the old style SH, so pre bash tests, and we should never use them. We're going okay. to see them in Google search results, but we know better. So we never use single square brackets. The double square brackets are our modern test command. So they evaluate to true right. or false. They, they will become an execute of zero for success, anything else for failure. And we use them as Booleans. So they're the square brackets. And inside those square brackets, you have minus 
all sorts of things. EQ for equals, GT for greater than, N for not an empty string, Z for an empty string. There's loads of them. So that's our square brackets, two of them. We also know that we can group multiple commands together inside roundy brackets. So whenever you should have one command, but you want more than one, you just pop them in brackets and hey presto, now they're together. And what I may never have explicitly said is that when you do the roundy brackets without the dollar symbol, the output is the exit code. So if you saved the output of a roundy bracket with no dollar, it's the exit code you'd end up saving, which is probably not what you want, which is why we almost always say dollar roundy bracket. And then we capture standard out into the variable. So if we go back up to our example, okay. P becomes equal to dollar roundy bracket, echo whatever to BC. So BC writes the answer to standard out, the dollar roundy bracket shoves standard out into P. That's how it works. Good. Okay. All right. So there are all the brackets we've met already, and that's quite a few. Now I'm going to introduce you to double round brackets. <laughs> okay. So double round brackets without a dollar sign will do the arithmetic and the, res the output will be the exit code of whatever the arithmetic is. And the arithmetic can include conditions. So the exit code could actually be useful. Hmm. Okay. A dollar sign means, no, no, I want the answer from the math. So if I multiply... Well, that's nice. So it, it sort of works the same way as single round brackets. Yes, there's logic to its very denseness, but there's the world of difference between run me a sequence of commands, which is single bracket, or do some math, which is double bracket. Okay. So it but is I like important. I built this up because Boolean tests are more like an arithmetic thing than not an arithmetic thing. So precisely. Yeah. No, that, with okay. those two together, I'm I'm screenshotting this with my mind, hoping Dorothy puts a a pointer to it in the PBS index. She will now. <laughs> So, like inside the double square brackets, the rules are different. So remember we said that inside the double square brackets, you can do things like minus F or does this file exist? And that doesn't work outside of square brackets, right? The square brackets are like a universe where there's different syntax. Yeah. The roundy brackets put us into a math universe. So we enter into math land. And in math land, the universe is a wee bit different. So the first thing is we do not prefix our variable names with a dollar. So if I want to access a variable named P, it's just P. Which if you think about every bit of calculus you've ever seen in your life, it's just the letters. So, but, okay, I freaked out when you said that we're not going to use dollar symbols with our variable names, but only when they're inside double roundy brackets. Correct. That is only in math okay. universe. This is sacred ground. <laughs> it's a really sacred ground. The only thing in here okay. is variable names and numbers, right? And the okay. various, you know, operators. No that strings. Do math. No Can't formatting. have strings in here. None of that because no this is math universe. Okay. okay. Everything's numbers, right? It's all numbers. I'm happier there. Yeah. Okay. So our variables do not get prefixed with the dollar symbol. And if you're looking in the documentation, this is called automatic variable expansion. That is, that is what they call that fact. Yeah. Okay. We can also use the assignment operator without having to cuddle it. So in normal bash universe, you have to say P equals a value, no spaces, or the whole thing explodes. Inside round your bracket universes, you can space your code out and it's all fine. Perfect. Can you cuddle it if you don't want to be scared and maybe make a mistake? By all means, you won't care. Okay. By all means, but you don't have to space it, it, but they'll start screwing up the other ones. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, we can also use a whole bunch of mathematical operators that have their purely mathematical meaning in here. They have no other meaning. So plus doesn't mean concatenate. It means mathematically add these things together. Minus means do the actual arithmetic. Slash means divide. Star means multiply. We also have our plus plus and our minus minus for incrementing and decrementing. And we have our percentage symbol for modulus, just like in JavaScript. And we have something that not all languages have. Star star means raised to the power of. So two star star okay. eight is two to the power of eight. Which right. you know, okay. can be useful. We can also do comparisons in here in arithmetic land. So double equals is a numeric comparison. Are they numerically equal? 
Mm-hmm. Not equal. So exclamation point equals is not equals is are they numerically not equal? Less than is numerical comparison. Greater than is numerical com- comparison. We have greater than or equal to and less than or equal to. And so just like normal, <laughs> just like <laughs> normal. Exactly. In here, it's like any other language we're used to. Right. The, the, okay. the, inside the double brackets, things are a lot simpler. We can also assign valuables to variables in here. So we can use equals for a simple assignment, plus equals for increment assignment, minus equals for a decrement assignment, star equals, slash equals, and even, I've never in my life used it, but it does exist, modulus equals. Percent equals. What, the, what would that do? So it is the equivalent of saying x equals x modulus the number. So oh, if you say okay. x percent equals 3, that is the same as saying x equals x modulus 3. Okay. I plan on never using that. Okay. So far, I've gotten <laughs> through life without using it. So, you know. <laughs> and then the last thing, our friend, the ternary operator from JavaScript, makes its first appearance here in Bashland. Hmm. It can only do numbers. It's very annoying. I wish it could do strings. But no, it can only do numbers. So we can say the variable P becomes equal to 40. The variable T becomes equal to 1 if... Oh, let me say all that again. I made a complete mess of that example. Um, basically, it's condition, question mark, answer one, colon, answer two. So the outcome of dollar, rounded bracket, rounded bracket, P double equals 42, question mark one, colon, zero, will be one if P is 42, or zero if P isn't 42. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry, I said that terribly, but yeah. So... All of this means that we can take a horrible statement like P becomes equal to dollar open roundy bracket echo quote dollar N star dollar M close quote pipe BC. We can replace all that with bracket bracket P equals N star M bracket bracket. Nice. That is so much more readable. Like nature, like nature intended, Bart. (laughs) Yes. Now, because when we don't use a dollar, the result is the exit code we can use it in if statements. So if roundy bracket, roundy bracket, P double equals 42, close our roundy brackets, then echo life, the universe, and everything. V to end our if statement. Okay, okay. Um, so just, just a darn second here. Mm. We can't replace P equals dollar round bracket, all that glop with... Round bracket, round bracket, P equals N times M. Those are not the same thing. The one with the do- the single um, roundy brackets is, uh, that's the actual value, not the, um, uh, it, it's it's not the exit code. So those two statements are not the same. Uh, sorry, I'm not with you at all anymore. Okay, this you wrote, this means we can rewrite a statement like P equals dollar round bracket, and you mm-hmm. said we can replace that with round bracket, round bracket, P equals N times N, round bracket, round bracket. Those are not the yes. same. That You would have to have a dollar sign in front of the second one for it to be the same. Mm, that is not correct. Because the end result of the first statement is that the variable named P will contain the result of our math. Correct. But the one with the two rounding brackets will, is the exit code. So they're not the same. Ah. They, no, no. Where are the roundy brackets? The result of the one? roundy brackets is being completely ignored in the shorter example. It is roundy bracket. It is not something becomes equal to roundy bracket, roundy bracket. It's just the roundy brackets. So the exit code is ignored. We don't use the exit code. Inside roundy bracket universe, we do the assignment. P becomes equal to N star M. It's all inside the brackets. Right? Why did you bother telling us that without the dollar sign? Because if, okay, if we wanted to, if we wanted to use, okay, we'll see, if we need to use the result of the math straight away, we need the dollar to say, give me the value, but we're not, we don't want the outcome of this. We just want to be in math universe to do the assignment, right? Everything we need is happening inside math land. So we, we don't use the output. The output from this statement is irrelevant. So if you've, you've got uh, 
Rowdy bracket, rowdy bracket, P equals N times M. If the next line mm -hmm. said echo dollar P, would it be the value of N times M? Yes, it would. Or would it be the exit code? No, no, it will be the value because inside the brackets, the assignment has happened, right? You have, you have made P Don't become right. equal to N. I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. You said, well, you copy said and paste it had to be the, the terminal. Well, then the, we, the explanation doesn't make any sense. Okay. If you said Q becomes equal to round you bracket, round you bracket, P equals N star M, then Q will have the exit code and P will have N star M. Okay. Oh, so P would still, the value in P would still exist, even though assigning it to something tells it the, just the exit code. That is yeah. very weird. So the that output is... of the roundy brackets is the exit code, but inside those roundy brackets, the thing we did was assign a value to P. So that's done. And then the exit code happens, but we don't give a bleep about the exit code, right? We're not doing anything with it. We wanted to get P to become equal to N times M without faffing about with pipes. Do we have to initialize P beforehand, or does it just come into being because of this statement? We've just here? made it come into being there because we said P becomes equal to. Okay. Okay. That's not any chance I'm going to remember that one, but I believe you right now. <laughs> well, practice, because practice is going to help you there because you're going to do math a lot. Yeah, I, I need lots of homework to do practice, though, Bart. You, 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 remember, I don't have any reason to use this, so weeks go by where ah, I don't do funny, anything. That's funny, but uh, you are going to get your homework. Even though we skipped over XARG, you're still going to get your homework. All right, good. Now, so we then say that we can use this inside conditional statements, right? So because the result of the roundy brackets is the exit code, you can use the roundy brackets in if statements, because if statements need exit codes. So if roundy bracket, roundy bracket, P double equals 42, so that's a comparison, not an assignment. Single equals is becomes equal to, double equals is is equal to. So that gives us the exit code, which is what the if needs. Then it can correctly print life, the universe and everything only when P has the value 42. Okay. We can also use the same syntax in our little shortcut with the ampersand ampersand. Because the exit code is a true-false value. Therefore, if that is true, then the second statement happens. Echo, life, the universe, and everything. So that is a shorter version of the same if statement. Yeah, I like that. Okay, good. Now, by using the dollar, we can get the answer from the math. So to get the sequence from 1 to whatever n times m is, we can say sec for the sequence command. The first argument is 1. The second argument is the value of n times m. Wait, what's, what's one? So the sequence command takes two arguments, where you want the sequence from and where you want the sequence to. So to get a sequence from one to n times m, the first argument is one. Oh, so okay. Okay. And the second argument is the value of the math. Okay. Well, I like it. Right. I do hope okay. to use it to cement it. Well, your challenge is to redo your table using round bracket math. So that means I have to have a reason to use math. Mine didn't have any math. Yours had You math. must have had math. You, you must oh, oh you, I'm you, sorry. I'm sorry to just do the multiplication. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, whatever, whatever math is in your solution, do it with the round your bracket land. And it should make your code cleaner, I hope. <laughs> that is the intention. So in the next it's been, so, it's been f more than four weeks since I did my I homework, so that's why I forgot I, I do actually do math. Yeah. I remember it being nearly as complicated as what you're doing, though. Yeah, mine yeah, just said know. echo range min times uh, the number, pipe it to BC, and then print the answer, print it out. That's all it said. Hmm. Okay, well, anyway, it, um, <laughs> you, uh, I'll change it. You change it, exactly. So in the next okay. time, our part two of this is going to be that one line of code <laughs> where we have the two XRGs. And it is going to take us probably 45 minutes to explain that line of code. Really? Okay, good. Yeah. Well, that, that explains why it took me close to two hours to read the show notes earlier today. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's important. XRGs is very powerful. So I, I, I don't want to rush XRGs. 
Good, good. I'm glad we did the arithmetic. That was fun. You were right. Hey. Okay. Well, with that, I think we have we have certainly given people enough to digest for a while. So let us hope they have lots and lots of happy computing between now right, and but uh, next first, day. But first, but first, Bart, where should they go to talk to other people who are doing the programming ooh. my stuff work? They should go to podfeet.com forward slash slack, where all the cool people hang out. There you go. And there's a PBS channel if you haven't been there. There is no gatekeeping to enter this. And I don't understand why, but nobody mean or nasty has gone into our Slack. Knock on wood. If you're still listening after the hour we've been recording this or more, you're our people. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's a filter. It works. All right. Now you're allowed to tell them to happily uh, compute, Bart. Good, good, good. Okay, folks. Well, there's lots there for you to digest. So until next time. Happy computing. If you learn as much from BART each week as I do, I'd like you to go over to lets-talk.ie and press one of the buttons over there to help support him. He does 98% of the work here. I'm just the stooge that listens to him and asks the dumb questions. If you go over to lets-talk.ie, you can support him on Patreon, you can donate via PayPal, or you can use one of his referral links. I really hope you'll go over and help him out. In the meantime, you can contact me at Podfeet or check out all of the shows we do over there over at podfeet.com. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.